turn into our Bibles to Genesis chapter number 21. Genesis chapter 21. We are uh, continuing in this series on the age of folk and uh, have a few more weeks still here left in the series. And uh, I was deeply uh, moved again by certainly the theme of the season and uh, was thinking how could we take this time to actually think about the hope that comes from all of the moms and the role that powerful roles that women play in all of our lives. Uh, so uh, today we're going to uh, take a look at uh, a, a, a woman in the Bible um, who I believe offers us all some very powerful uh, things and, and uh, who herself had to be sustained by hope. And her name is Hagar. Uh, she is uh, a woman who uh, was uh, sold uh, into slavery or at least in, at, into servitude. It was not the kind of child slavery we think of today, but uh, she was uh, given to Abraham and uh, Sarai or Sarah uh, as a servant. She was from Egypt, so uh, her presence uh, there uh, in the kind of Mediterranean part of the uh, world back in that space of time was, was one of a woman of African descent. Certainly, uh, most of us uh, who are students of the Bible history know that uh, more than likely many, many of uh, the folks in, in the uh, region of the Mediterranean were dark-skinned folk by phenotype. Uh, certainly people had all kinds of different uh, countries of origin. This particular woman, Hagar, was from uh, the country uh, in the land of Egypt. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, so Genesis chapter 21, verse number 9 is where we'll start. Um, it's on the screen. You can follow along certainly in uh, the text with us. And the Word of God says this. One day, Sarah, who was the wife of Abraham. Now, maybe I should give you a little bit more background. Some of y'all may not know uh, the significance of Sarah and Abraham. Abraham uh, was uh, this uh, uh, just, just a regular guy that God met and called uh, out of the land of earth. And he told him that I'm just going to bless you. God just picked him and said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your family. And you all go through you. The whole earth is going to be blessed. And uh, Abraham was an old man when God first called him. And uh, he had a wife and her name was Sarai or Sarah. And uh, uh, she was not able to produce children or Abraham was not able to produce children. You know, back in the day, in the scriptures, uh, you know, uh, there was this uh, kind of sense that if uh, women could not produce children, it was uh, often due to some kind of physiological uh, deficiency in their body. Um, and yet, we know, the more we study history, that uh, sometimes it wasn't about the woman, it was about the man. Shooting blanks, uh, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and he was not able uh, to, to produce any children. So, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly what was going on. We just know there was no kids. Amen? Um, but in this particular story, we certainly see that uh, Abraham and Sarah uh, engaged by God, and yet God chose them to be two people through which the whole earth would be blessed. And God told them he was going to make them a great people. Yeah. And God told them this promise while they were old without the ability to have any children. And ain't that like God to tell you something so ridiculous, amen? You just got God, if you ever had, you feel like God told you something, it's not like God, I don't know what you talk about. Uh, at least you maybe didn't say it, because very few of us feel comfortable saying that to God, amen? <laughs> but we think it. Anybody ever thought it? Like, God, I don't know. All right, thank God for those four or five times <laughs> here in church on Monday's Day. Praise God. And uh, so, so, so they were not able to have children, and part of what happened is uh, Hagar is introduced into this situation, and... Uh, and, and what, what, what ended up happening is Sarah uh, allowed uh, Hagar uh, to uh, uh, be a surrogate, if you will. And uh, this situation 
produces a baby by the name of Ishmael. And uh, as we pick up the story here, later on, Sarah eventually begins to have the ability to produce children, or Abraham and her produce a child. And so Abraham and Sarah have now just birthed Isaac. So we have Isaac, the son of Abraham, and Sarah. And now we also have in the picture Hagar and Abraham's child, Ishmael. And this is where all the baby mama drama stuff like officially start. Amen. That's why I tell people, ain't nothing new under the sun. Amen. There's baby mama drama all the way back then. And uh, somehow God still was able to bless the whole world in spite of baby mama drama. Is that alright? So uh, don't be worried about your drama. God can figure out a way to cut you all and give you a high five and tell them God will cut you it. God will cut you it. So let's see how God cuts through this drop, all right? Uh, verse number nine, one day Sarah saw the son that Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham and poking fun at her son Isaac. And she told Abraham, get rid of this slave woman and her son. No child of this slave is going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. Matter gave great pain to Abraham. After all, Ishmael was his son. God spoke to Abraham, don't feel badly about the boy and your maid. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for your descendants will come through Isaac. Regarding your maid's son, be assured that I'll also develop a great nation from him, for he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, got some food together and a canteen of water for Hagar, put them on her back, and sent her away with the child. She wandered off into the desert of Hershiba, where when the water was gone, she left the child under a shrub and went off 50 yards or so. And she said, I can't watch my son die. And as she sat, she broke into sobs. Meanwhile, God heard the boy crying. The angel of God called from heaven to Hagar, what's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy and knows the fix he's in. Get up now, get the boy, hold him tight. We're going to make him a great nation. And just then God opened her eyes. And she looked and she saw a well of water. She went to it, filled her canteen, gave the boy a long, cool drink. And God was on the boy's side as he grew up. He lived out in the desert, became a skilled archer. He lived in the Paran wilderness and his mother got him a wife from Egypt. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Be to God. So we're going to speak from uh, a topic. Uh, I call it the gospel according to Hagar. Uh, simply, uh, there is hope in being seen. There is hope in being seen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to bless the word of God for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts. So we will not sin against you, and please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy that rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. Bless every mother and every woman and every life giver in this place today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. We pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Everybody say, God sees me. God sees me. Now, uh, it is, I think, a very important, this message for me is a very important and appropriate message uh, for a number of different reasons. I uh, certainly have been very impacted uh, through the season of this last week. Many of my friends who are moms all across the country uh, were in Washington, D.C. and they were engaging in what they called a Mother's March. Um, and they were lifting up all the many lives of, of their children who have been lost to all kinds of state violence, whether it's uh, just uh, random death in communities, death at the hands of states, uh, or police, death uh, through incarceration. Um, and uh, I was very moved by this uh, mantra that many of them were saying, not one more, and the kind of uh, sorrow that many of the women in, in uh, these marches and these rallies across the country participated in brought me back to um, the deep kind of connection that uh, moms have with their children. 
and how hard those connections can be uh, when uh, they get disrupted for whatever kind of reason. I remember when uh, I was doing a funeral for one of the young people, and uh, I'm standing in the funeral home, and folks, you know, go around, and, and uh, the mom uh, is, is uh, you know, making her way past to say her last regards, and she stopped and asked me, why did God take my baby? And you know, I, I was you know just back from seminary, you know, so I thought I had all the answers, and uh, that answer still stumps me today. Amen. I don't have no response. What is it said? Amen. To a, a mom who is in distress, to someone who has suffered loss, and it's not just the loss of life, but how many of you know? Uh, even the threat itself can be so anguish filled that you and I. Uh, me and all my male counterparts, my male homies, uh, we, 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 we say we understand, but we don't, praise the Lord. Uh, I'm always moved by the times I have to go to court, and, uh, and, 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 and always the presence of the mothers, amen. And, uh, you know, uh, some of the fathers that I work with, uh, yeah, he going to have to learn hard. So, uh, you know, uh, I hope he figured that out. Moms, even as they say it, they still right there. Oh, my junior, he goes, he, he's not, he's not a bad person, and he just need a little bit more love, and, and he need more chances, and he, you know, moms have a way of making these connections with us that transcend whatever kind of trouble we in. And it is, you know, um, such a powerful connection. I, I, I recall again when I was in Washington, D.C., the week that the Newtown shooting happened, we were all in some meetings. We were doing some training. It was the middle of the day, and uh, it was, uh, I was there with a number of mothers who had lost their children to gun violence. Um, a couple of them were from uh, Virginia during the Virginia Tech mass shooting. Some were there from Denver, Colorado during the mass shooting. And when they announced the Newtown shooting, that started to unfold. We were in a session doing some training on how to message around uh, the moral imperative related to gun violence. And I, uh, again, was deeply impacted by the way many of the mothers had to relive these pains and these challenges and the fears that they had. And it just causes me to always remember that uh, the uniqueness of moms, of people who play these roles in our lives, is more than just a connection of, uh, of, of, of emotion, but it is a connection related to the giving of life. Mm -hmm. That moms have this ability, there all of us are here, because they are able to give life. And this life that we are often gifted with, uh, some through the biological moms we have, and how many know uh, there's some seasons in our lives where our moms, biological moms, can't be there, and God finds a way to bring other life givers into our lives, right? Uh, so, so it's so important to appreciate that there's a unique kind of contribution I believe moms make, whether they are our biological, physical moms, or just those nurturers, those mentors, those huggers, amen, those, those, those big mamas to them, you know, them people that, that, you know, always felt like they could take great license in your life, amen, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, always felt like they could give you that advice that you didn't ask for, amen, those, those folks who always could tell you a breath stand, amen, you know, them kind of folks, folks who are always, they're just committed by, by their, their orientation in the world to be a nurturer, a life giver. How do you quantify the contribution of these moms? And there's been many efforts to do so. I was looking at a, at a, uh, a study that was on uh, one of these news channels, and they were trying to uh, quantify uh, the kind of monthly income that uh, moms who stay at home or women who stay at home and, and provide uh, their children, and, and uh, not a whole lot of uh, case where we have too many 
one household uh, uh, situation, amen, because the economy is so tough, amen, and rough, amen, and, and you got to be making some money, amen, you in the Bay Area work on one household, somebody say amen, amen. amen. And we, we got a double household, tell you that, two times, two times, both working double, triple time, but, but it was so fascinating to listen to the study, because they started to calculate the wages of a, of a stay-at-home mother or a caregiver, someone who takes care of folk. And uh, they said when you add up the cooking and the cleaning, when you add up all the meetings that need to be done for school, or you look at the extracurricular activities that are being engaged in, you look at the homework that is being uh, done to help for the shopping, amen, uh, you know, the, 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 the shopping for food and, you know, all the other, you know, extracurricular shopping, amen, that, that folk do. You look at all that and you add the number up together, they said that the take-home pay would be $117,000 per year. Man, man, that's so cool, God. Uh, if you want to be a stay-at-home mom, say, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess that's a calculated take-home pay. Uh, think about that for a second. The, 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 however they quantified it, I think they were seeking to express there is a very rich contribution that moms and caregivers make in the lives of folk today. And yet, we can talk about the contribution, but when we look at the many ways that women are erased in our society, many ways that women are, are minimized in this society, uh, trivialized, in our society, reduced in our society. You know, uh, you, you, you see good studies that talk a lot about how uh, the, 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 given even all the, the double roles that women have to play in our society, that they are, are still not making equal pay. Amen. And then when you start to break that down by race, it gets even more challenging. Amen. Uh, that, 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 you know, there's, there's all kinds of, uh, Kimberly, I think her name is Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, talks about intersectionality. Man, this nice big old word uh, that just uh, highlights that we all have many, many kinds of factors and, and ways we show up in the world that are not just about our race, and not just about our gender, and not just about our religion, and our country of origin, or our sexuality, or, or our class, or our, our income, but we all are showing up many different ways at one time. And why is this so important? Well, I think it's important because uh, how many of you know you can be free in one area of your life and still be bound in another? Hello, somebody. Man, and there's a whole lot of conversation that we have to begin to start having, even inside the church. Uh, what does it mean for us to help be forces of liberation for people where folk can get hope by being seen in their full self? Mm. And this is what I love about, about God is because I don't think God is intimidated by you showing up in your full self. Hello, somebody. Amen. God don't want you to show up, you know, uh, at church, you know, uh, you know, hide and sit back in the corner, uh, or you don't want to show up at your job, hide and sit in the corner. He don't want you to show up in your house, hide and sit in the corner. But God has created you with the fullness of who you are, and it is a gift. And too often, maybe we don't say this enough in the church, amen. Uh, church is easily being able to be kind of characterized as a house of patriarchy, amen. A place where uh, women can easily uh, find their place. Uh, you know, someone used to say back in the day that the, uh, 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 the role of a woman was in the, in the kitchen and the bedroom. I think I was a good time the other day. And, uh, you know, it's one of those uh, women empowerment episodes in Good Time. I don't know if y'all watch, used to watch Good Times. Uh, good Times, a good show, amen. If, if, if you think about it, now, you know, I didn't appreciate growing up, but it was a very much a social justice show. They talked about a lot of issues on Good Times. Like, had all, Norman Lear did a great job. I remember one of the episodes, uh, you know, uh, Florida and Bologna, and went to one of those uh, 
uh, uh, women empowerment groups, and she came home, and you know, there was a, uh, Jane was home, and he was with his boys, and they got him all gassed up, and you know, they started arguing, and he went there, right? He said, you know, Florida's only one place where the women belong. He's like, don't say it, Jane, don't say it, Jane. Maybe in the living room and the basement. Yeah. But, but this idea, right, that these kinds of roles are often reinforced to us. We learn this, we pick up these kinds of things, and why do we need to hear these messages of hope coming from the Word of God? It's because they are often intended to unravel some of these lies that are fed to us as the truth. creates and, and has roles that people fill and, and, and there's nothing wrong with roles, complementary roles, and yet at the same time, how many, many of us know that there's also always space for conversation and negotiation? And you as a woman, as a mom, the life giver, someone told me I, I was in one of these meetings and they said, you know, if you kill a, 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 a male, you, uh, you, you, you take a, a, a single person, but if you kill a woman, you take a whole civilization. Right? That, that as much as I hope I can be productive, amen, I'm not reproducing nothing. Amen. <laughs> Ain't no babies coming out of nowhere. Amen. It's just the will of God for my life. And I, I remember the two babies my wife was able to give to us. Amen. And I watched how she did the first one with, you know, a little bit of medicine and the second one without any medicine. Amen. And she was just a wonderful, wonderful gift from God. Amen. And I thank God because I couldn't do it. Amen. I, I'd be like, uh, no, no. The gift of moms, the gift of women, they go through all of this to produce this life. It is a part of their nature by God. And yet, even in the midst of all of this uniqueness, the world can actually put all kinds of burdens and pressures to erase, evade, marginalize, minimize, reduce moms and women. And I'm here to tell you today that uh, we need you as the mother and the women in our lives to be brimming with hope. Amen. If nobody ever tells you you are fearfully and wonderfully made, I want you to know your pastor, your church, and everybody in this place believe you are the bomb digging. Amen. You know, just, 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 just find you a, a sister next to you behind you, a high five, and say, you're the bomb, you're the bomb. That's the, that's the 21st century translation of you. I've been fearfully and wonderfully made. Ain't nothing but you're the bomb, all right? about yourself. How many know you can live your life with a different level of confidence and clarity? Yeah. When you know that you've been created for a unique purpose and a time and a season, I mean, even when trouble and trial comes, uh, you don't allow the trouble and trial to overwhelm you or even deter you, but you can always remember that you have been created just by you being a woman, a great gift from the Almighty God. may not always see that gift. And people who don't see your gift will often create all kinds of challenges for you and I that we have to then push through in order to become and be reminded of who we are. And I love the Word of God, and yet I know the Word of God has often been used as a tool to exclude folk, to uh, promote or, or desensitize us towards the violence associated with our women. And I find this text to be one of these such texts. And I've heard these texts preached all very often. And uh, usually, you know, uh, the champion in the story is not Hagar. 
Usually in this text, the champion of the story is Sarah. The champion of the story is Abraham. Who, who, and it's funny, uh, we're going we to talk about the brothers on Father's Day, praise God. It's not going to be a big truck message. We're going to ask a few questions about why the brothers always seem to be okay with, you know, having all these women, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Fascinating. You know, Sarah gives, uh, you know, a uh, servant, Hagar, you should, you know, go, go, go hang out with my husband, amen, you know, help us get this baby. And Abraham did not seem to object. <laughs> Look at Jacob. And Jacob, same thing. He, he loved Rachel. But, but the custom said that he had to work seven years in order to get Rachel. Uh, and he had to marry Leah first. And he didn't seem to object either. Amen. David, all these fellas, amen. We know why, fellas. We'll talk about the Father's Day. <laughs> but, 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 but the point is, Scripture can easily reinforce, consciously or subconsciously, some of these narratives, and we must interrogate them. Yeah, it's good. And we must mine them, pull from them lessons that we can get hope from. Yeah. Because even in your mistakes, there can be some hope pulled out of that thing. I mean, don't, don't, don't limit yourself to having to be perfect in order for you to be able to get some hope out of some stuff. Yeah, it's good. There's was learned through some of our worst mistakes. Yeah. 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 It didn't feel good. I know like I was going through the mistakes like, you know, you know, full of joy and happiness. Right. Amen. But I, I remember. Amen. What I learned back then, I remember, and it gives me hope. Yeah. Right. And this is the gospel according to Hagar, I believe. Hagar was a woman from Egypt was given as some kind of uh, a, a financial exchange between some folk in Egypt and Abraham and Sarah, given to Abraham and his folk as a servant. And there was all kind of politics, family politics, and law going on in there. So these were normative things, necessarily not uh, oppressive in, in, a, in a very strict sense, although we see that uh, uh, Hagar's name means stranger. Mm. Hagar's name uh, denotes that she was uh, not welcome in the house of Abraham. She was an outsider. Mm -hmm. Hagar represents all the women and even some, some men, arguably, in the Bible who are excluded or despised. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and Hagar, even within the, 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 the familial network, um, was even representative of Sarah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Sarah was not necessarily in the, in the ancient world because she was barren, known to be barren. She herself would have been excluded as well. Mm -hmm. Let's think about this for a second, right? You have Hagar, a servant woman from another country, living in the house of someone who uh, always reminds her that she is excluded by the very one who herself in the same culture is considered excluded because she can't do no life either. This is the way systems and structures can work in our lives and we can reinforce oppression. Understand? Trying to make her way back to Egypt. I don't know 
want you to think about the riskiness of, of, of what she was trying to do. Possibly a really young teenager, or at least early in her 20s, making a trip back to Egypt all by herself <coughs> because she was so excluded from her community. Mm -hmm. just, just absorbing all the different things that Hagar had to overcome. Even though she was someone that God created. Someone that God fashioned and shaped in, in the womb of her mom just as much as Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> and I am very much aware that even in this moment we're living in right now, uh, there's so much exclusion going on in our communities and in our country. A lot of it, particularly as we're talking about the issues of, of uh, Black Lives Matter and, and the, the plight of people of color, women of color. We're seeing all the many ways that, that women of all racial backgrounds are easily being marginalized. Even in our movement, you know, uh, we've been trying to keep alive the names of not just the young men and older men who have been killed by police violence, but also the women as well. And how their lives are not necessarily getting any measure of justice. They are regarded as even more disposable. Uh, a young woman, I was in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and, and with Kia Boyd, a, a young woman from Chicago who was killed by a police officer, and, and they did her trial, and, and they ended up throwing her trial out, and letting the officer go home, and they did a rally for Kia Boyd in a few places, and, and barely anybody showed up. And some of my friends, again, who were leading that were just so distraught. They were like, so is it that when, when the lives of women of color or other women are lost, no one shows up to mourn and to protest and to, and to lift up our voices as a way of, 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 of saying that their lives matter as well. And then the next week, all, of course, all the stuff happened in Baltimore. And of course, we know we saw what happened in Baltimore. Amen. And, and, and see, part of the trap that I believe some of this causes for us if we're not willing and able to wrestle with this is we can take these conversations as an antagonistic conversation rather than a complementary conversation. Mm -hmm. Because what good is it for me to be upset only about certain lives uh, when we need all the lives? Amen. I don't know about you, but I would not want to live in a world with just some me. But sometimes, you know, I just want to be able. Amen. <laughs> but there's a good kind of complimentary conversation that we all need to be having. Why? Because it reaffirms the value of our women. And when we don't do that, I believe we don't allow our sisters to be seen. And no matter your racial background, black, white, Latino, Asian, polka dot, Native American, stripes, wherever you are, I need our sisters to be seen. I want you to be seen. I want you to feel valued. I want you to know that you are a gift to the world. And Hagar is a great gift to us, even not being regarded as a champion. Look at all the things that she gives. Us. Let me run through these ideas that I think are a gift to us. The first thing I think we see in this text is that trauma is real. Yes. 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 The gospel according to Hagar teaches us that trauma is real. And one great risk when we start talking about what moms and caregivers and life givers and women have to endure is we will often minimize trauma. Mm. We will make folk feel like, well, why are you making such a big deal? You ever told you that? You make such a big deal about this stuff. Man, just come on now. Just go along and get along. He will try to silence your own voice when you're speaking up about 
the trauma and the pain that you feel. And then you'll get these, 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 these interesting words out. Michelle Obama was doing an a, a interview this weekend. She talked about the challenges she had to face as the first African-American first lady. And she said throughout the campaign, she was having to carry this kind of awareness that she had to respond a certain way. She would be characterized as an angry black woman. Mm -hmm. Right? She would have to, she would have to make sure that you know she didn't do certain gestures. <laughs> right. Well, 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 well. Not realizing that some of that stuff is secondary trauma. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the primary trauma that some of our sisters have to go through. Amen. Where, you know, uh, uh, many of them, of you, of us, of our, our loved ones, uh, research says that one out of every three women will find themselves in their lives subjected to some kind of physical trauma. Mm -hmm. Think about this for a second, right? That all of us in this place will be impacted by the trauma of the women in our lives. And you and I, we have to be mindful of that. Why? So we can be agents of healing mm -hmm. in each other's lives. We can't help folks heal if we don't first acknowledge there's some trauma. Hello, somebody. Is that 
that she had real challenges and real problems caused by people who were closest to her, but she did not allow her whole life to be limited by that trauma and that pain. And that's a good lesson for all of us to learn today. You as a human being are going to experience some hardship, but don't let it be the thing that defines your whole life. But ask God for some healing uh, in this place. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need some healing. I need some healing. I need some healing. The second thing that the scripture lifts up that I find to be super life giving is that it reminds you and I, particularly all of our women and sisters in the house, that you are worthy. Gospel according to Hagar is a reminder to all of us that even in spite of your trauma, you are worthy. How many of you know we can experience trauma, compounding trauma, coalescing trauma, and it starts to reduce us and causes us to think that our worth is not that high. And we can start to live our lives in this way. And again, Hagar in the story, her name is Stranger. She was despised and looked upon negatively by people around her. And she very much could have internalized that kind of trauma and pain and exclusion. How many of you know this stuff can calcify in our lives and cause us to lose hope? Yeah. Because you see that even through all of the negativity of what she was going through, God still was able to be present in her life yes. in such a way where he reminded her yes. that she was worth it. Yes. Lord, help me today. Yes. Help us to be people and agents of God where we can remind one another, remind us. Our women, our moms, our caregivers, our life givers, that you are worthy. In a world that would seek to reduce you, you are worthy. In a world that would seek to minimize you, you are worthy. Your value is not diminished because the world can't see the value in you. Folks on your job can't see the value. Folks at your school. Can't figure out. We do pretty good here at the church. I hope that you know we try to celebrate and, yeah. and lift up uh, and make visible the leadership of our sisters here. But even if you got a few folk in here who's some haters, you ought to just remind them that I'm worthy. Hey. Yeah. I'm worthy of being respected. My leadership is worthy of being followed. My intellect is worthy of being paid attention to. My wisdom is worthy. Of being listened to. I am worthy. Amen. God wants you to know you are worthy of the best dreams that He's placed in your life. Yeah. And sometimes those dreams may run up against other people's dreams, but guess what? God still says you're worthy. Right. Understand, Ishmael was, was, was a contingency plan in the mind of Sarah, but in the mind of Hagar and even in the mind of God, Ishmael became great. Mm -hmm. Because God realized she's worthy. That what she produced is worthy to receive every blessing and every promise. I want you to be someone that walks with your head held up. You're worthy. You're worthy to be respected and loved and revered. Even when folks, you know, hate on you, you still worthy. Don't allow these kinds of negative messages and associations to calcify in your heart because you lose your hope. Don't repeat that stuff. No. If it's junk, it ain't coming in here to diminish my value. I am worthy. You are worthy. The third thing the text lifts up, it says that you are not forgotten. Think about this for a second. You are not forgotten. I love how in this story, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Abraham sends uh, 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 Hagar and Ishmael out, and in their mind, it's out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Sarah, she must have woke up after, after 
after, you know, they, they removed them from their, their community, and she was like, cool, I'm glad I don't have to worry about them no more. <laughs> they forgot about them. How do you know just because people forget about you? You are not forgotten Amen. by God. was excluded, but the scripture says that she cried out to the Lord. She prayed, and an angel of the Lord came and visited her. Now, it is not always the case that the angel that came, that comes and visited in the scriptural text is actually pointing to like a physical manifestation of an angel, you know, in our minds with wings and or some kind of humanoid figure. Sometimes in the scripture, it just is meaning to denote that a communication from God, some kind of word from the Lord, some kind of some kind of experience reaffirmed and awoke uh, something inside uh, of the person that they attribute to God. And the way they attribute to God is because it produced life for them. What's my point? My point is. If you are feeling forgotten, always know there's a word from the Lord. There's an angel. There's a messenger. There's a message that God is seeking to communicate to you to remind you that you are not forgotten. God don't get amnesia when it comes to the people of God. And some of us, when we are forgotten, how many of you know we'll start to look for other folk mm -hmm. to fill the voids mm -hmm. from the folk who have left us or pushed us aside? That's why it's important for us to have good discernment. Because many of us look for the signs from God. We look for the angels, but we have in our mind only one kind of angelic visitation. Hello, somebody. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all, you know, God, if I told you an angel, you have in your mind a description of what an angel would look like, and then if you don't see that angel, you feel like God ain't visiting you. <laughs> but how many of you know God can visit you in all kinds of ways? But you and I need some discernment to make sure that's God. <laughs> that ain't, you know, uh, 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 a faith angel. Scripture says, the, the enemy, the adversary, the devil can appear as an angel of light. Some of us get tricked. Good we bamboo will let us straight. Because we don't have a discernment. So we'll welcome all kinds of stuff into our lives when we think we are forgotten to get affirmation. But the gospel according to Hagar is that even while she was in the middle of her season, it appeared of being forgotten, she cried out to the Lord and God reminded her she was not forgotten. Psalms 9 verse 12, it says this, God remembers those who suffer. He does not forget their cry. And I want you to, I want you to realize you're never forgotten. The Lord is saying that he punishes those who wrong him. Ooh, you better make sure you, you, you're on the right side of that equation. <laughs> I would hate to be punished by God. Yeah. It was John the Networks talked about, he preached a sermon back in the 1800s during the revival period, and it was called uh, Falling into the Hands of an Angry God. Mm. Ooh, that thing should shiver through my spine too. I said, Lord, don't let me be on the punishing side of your relationship. Right. Final thing that the scripture lifts up simply is this. God keeps promises. Hagar, isolated out there in the wilderness. Child is seeming like he's getting ready to die. She cries out to God, and God reminds Hagar of the promise he made to her the first time she was excluded and kicked out. In our lives and in our experiences, there are many, many things that cause us to think that God has forgotten, that life is 
beating us down. And I want you to be someone who always remembers that God keeps God's promises. God promised you that you were going to win, winning is on the way. God promised you that your children were going to be saved, salvation is on the way. God promised you that your heart is going to be healed, healing is on the way. Your mind, your spirit, God keeps promising. And even though Abraham and Sarah didn't have the, the robust vision to see the blessing that Hagar and Ishmael could be, and they were thrown out, God says that I'm going to keep the word I've made to you. Your son will be great. Yes. Amen. Your son will be great. Your son will be a big nation, just like I promised to you several years ago. And we find in this story that even through all the hardship, God was able to turn that whole situation into such a blessing that most folk who come from the Arab nations that read these kinds of biblical texts attribute the whole kind of Arab descendants from Ishmael. Now, if you've been counting, that's a pretty big nation, praise the Lord. That, that God's word will never return more. It will always accomplish. God says. Last slide, and then we're going to close on out here. Only God can turn a mess into a mess. A test into a testimony. A trial into a triumph. A victim into a victory. for us today on this Mother's Day. All my wonderful, amazing, life-giving women, sisters, aunties, grandmas, mamas, and all of them. You are seen. You are not invisible. You are seen in your fullness. The tears you cry, they are seen. The pains you have, they are seen. The joy, the love, you are visible, you are seen. And because you are seen, not just by us, but by God, you always got some hope. And I need y'all to have some hope, because I'm going to need some hope from y'all. Right? Yeah. Hello, I will, we, all us fellas and all us who depend on this life-giving hope that's inside of y'all, we need you to be filled with some hope. Right. We got some ATM cards, amen. We always going to be trying to draw from y'all to help us keep moving. I love the biblical uh, story of Mary. My mom was like this in my life. Scripture says that uh, Jesus, as he was growing up, that Mary remembered and pondered all these things in her heart. Yeah. All the words that were spoken over the life of Jesus. All the experiences that Jesus had. And Mary, I believe, was one of those hope-giving stations for Jesus as he navigated through his life. My mom was like that for, for me, I'm sure for all of us. Amen. We all had all these nice things that people would say. And my mom was one of those folks who just always remind us we are better than who we were at that moment. Reminded us of the God-given assignment that was in our lives. Always gave us hope. Always gave us the ability to see beyond the limitations of our own fallenness and challenges and struggles. People like my mom, all these, these women, uh, my, my pastor's wife down in San Jose, uh, uh, Janice Days. I thank God that God places these women in my life to remind me, to ponder this stuff in their heart. And my sisters, I want you to know that this is the uniqueness and the gift that you have in your brain in the world. On this Mother's Day, if you are a mom, if you are a caregiver, a life giver, if anyone draws any kind of hope and life in your life, we want to honor and say thank you. God honors you today. Happy Mother's Day. Let's stand for our